Well, the time of 2 o'clock having arrived and all the panelists, panelists having arrived, it is my uh, distinct pleasure to be the moderator of a very distinctive group of people talking about what perhaps and is the most important issue with respect to everything that we're dealing with in education and in our society. For it truly matters not what structures we have, what policies we have, what procedures we have, or any of the other things that we have, including resources, if we do not have the leaders to effectively set out a vision, utilize the resources, make sure that we're on task towards achieving the goals that we set out. And on this panel are four very, very successful leaders from different categories of leadership, all of which have a very long and successful connection with education. I'm not going to spend time introducing them, for they, uh, a good leader knows what to say about themselves. On the, on the issue of, <laughs> on the issue of leadership, I, I have always been impressed at how much is written. I, I made a point today just to look at Amazon. Key, keyword leadership. How many books come up? 12,074 books on leadership. And one that has just come out this month sounds very interesting. 16 scandals, 20 years of sex, lies, and other habits of great leaders. <laughs> And I don't think any of that would apply to these panelists. <laughs> uh, another recent book is 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And amongst those 21 laws are such qualities as influence, trust, respect, heart, and empowerment. Those terms do apply to these panelists. And with that, we're going to begin our discussion. We'll have 10 or 15 minute commentaries from each of the panelists, and then we're going to open it up for questions. And we're going to start with our distinguished state senator who was a college president in a former life, Jack Scott. Uh, well, thank you, Bob. Uh, after your description of uh, uh, what leaders enjoyed, I seem like I've missed out on some of it. <laughs> uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that uh, uh, one got in on uh, all those freebies that you're talking about. But anyway, uh, it's great to be here. Um, he mentioned the fact, uh, Bob mentioned the fact that I had uh, been involved in college leadership, and I've been involved in higher education a lot longer than I've been involved in political leadership. Uh, actually, uh, I spent over 30 years in higher education, and 25 of those years was in college administration. The last uh, two posts that I held were college presidencies. I was president of Cypress College, which is in Orange County, um, and from uh, 1978 to 1987. And then I was president of Pasadena City College from 1987 through 1995. And uh, as I was retiring from the college, uh, I was asked uh, to uh, run for office. And I thought about it a while. And one of the things that appealed to me was the contribution that I could make to education. And uh, so I did run. And I served four years in the assembly. And now I've been elected to the state senate. Recently, I was asked to uh, uh, make a talk about the American Constitution, uh, my own PhD is in the area of American history, and so I was glad to do that. And as I studied that early period in our history, uh, the successful revolution uh, that we were able to uh, accomplish, and the fact that uh, we were able to beat the most powerful military force of that time, and then the fact that we in turn uh, had a constitution that survived over 200 years, and yet all this happened from a nation that had less than 4 million people. And I was thinking about what caused that, and I had to go to leadership. Uh, at that particular time, 
there was a convergence of some really remarkable individuals. Uh, just think of the list. George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, and I probably could add to that list. These remarkable leaders made a tremendous difference in the birth of our nation. And when you look at the success of any organization, uh, surely it takes a lot of people to make an organization a success, but one absolutely essential ingredient is an effective leader. It's always true, whether you look in the area of the corporate world, uh, whether you look in the world of uh, the military or uh, wherever you turn, time and time again you look and you see that often an institution is the shadow of a dynamic leader. And I believe that in order for there to be good leadership, there has to be good training for leaders. Um, now, once again, I'm going to use an analogy, and I'm going to talk a little bit and mention a West Point as an illustration. Early in the history of our nation, we realized that if we were going to have effective military leaders, we had to have some place for them to receive training. And uh, if you're a student of World War II and you just begin to name off uh, these individuals, Douglas MacArthur, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, George Patton, Omar Bradley, they were all graduates of West Point. They all received some training in leadership. Churches realized that very early uh, in the history of the world when they began uh, to have seminaries where individuals could receive leadership. We have the MBA. But often we look over into the field of education and uh, sometime leadership is just happenstance. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the community colleges and I, I will address that because uh, that's my background and I've tried since I've been up here to give some aid and sustenance to the California community colleges. California Community Colleges is a huge business. Five billion dollars budget this year counting the general fund and property taxes. 107 community colleges in California. Uh, when I was president of Pasadena City College we had a budget of around 60 million dollars. Now that's a good sized corporation. So there are a lot of challenges. The tidal wave is hitting colleges in California this year, perhaps in, having their strongest impact, and unfortunately, at the very time when we're experiencing a uh, budget deficit. And so we're having great difficulty uh, bringing the dollars to bear on this particular challenge. Uh, you know what Tidal Wave 2 is. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you here in the audience are educators. I know some of you are because I know you. But uh, just uh, think of the, the number of students. I uh, got some figures from community colleges the other day, and they had an increase of 6.9% this fall from last fall. Uh, they think maybe in the California community colleges, counting non-credit, credit students, and part-time students, as well as full-time students, we'll have close to three million students in California this year. Over a million full-time equivalents. Uh, now, when you, when you think about that, you think of the enormity uh, of the challenge. And yet, what are we doing to train leaders? I made uh, a contribution to this area when I was able to get $450,000 into the state budget in order to start a community college leadership development institute. Uh, I know Dr. Carroll here to my right uh, knows about that. Uh, she serves as president of San Diego Mesa College and, and she's been one of the effective leaders in that. The point is that that's just really a drop in the bucket, but fortunately Claremont Graduate University has risen to the challenge. They've started a community college leadership program. Before, often, 
many of those individuals who wanted to get training in community college leadership had to go out of state in order to get it. What happens in a community college, the average community college, and I can speak from some experience, you suddenly have a, uh, an administrative opening. Let's say it's the division dean of the liberal arts division. Well, you look around and you think, well, Mary or Joe are excellent teachers, and they seem to be liked by their colleagues, and their colleagues uh, nominate them, and so we appoint them as the division dean. Now, they had had training and years of experience as a teacher, but the complexities of management they haven't dealt with before. And so what happens? Well, they often perform rather well, but it's kind of a sink or swim thing. They're trying to pick something up. They're trying to learn as they go. And sometimes personnel mistakes are made. We know, for instance, that the personnel rules affecting colleges in California are, are huge in nature. And you've got to cross every T and, and you know, dot every I. When I was in uh, administrative post, I used to say if there are 10 steps in a personnel process and you miss step number seven, then the whole case is blown. You just can't do it. So it's not a very good way to run a railroad is what I'm trying to say, that we are, we are simply um, doing the best we can. Sometimes in desperation I would look around and uh, I would rob from some other community college <laughs> uh, uh, rather than grow our own. Uh, I remember when I came to Pasadena City College, two very key positions opened up. One had to do with development and the other one had to do with uh, the entire administrative affairs involving the fiscal matters and the buildings. And so I looked at other colleges and I found some very capable people and uh, I used uh, my powers of persuasion and fortunately those two individuals came. But that didn't exactly, uh, that left a vacancy at other places. So. What I'm trying to say is that we are really hit and miss in terms of training. We worked, uh, for instance, uh, when we saw the, the dearth of individuals who were getting the EDD degree in California. Uh, we began to push forward with the idea in mind uh, that the California State University, which said that they would be willing to step forward and do this, and so finally, and I think there was a little pressure involved in this. There was an alliance formed between the University of California and California State University to increase the number of EDDs, uh, that management degree. Well, uh, the point is that uh, uh, we need training. Just stop and think for a moment. When we are looking for educational leaders, whether we're talking about the California State University, the independent colleges and universities in California, the University of California. Think of the complexity of skills that are required. They're organizational skills. Just the sheer matter of class schedule. When you uh, are trying to determine uh, what teachers to use and what classes he or she should teach and what rooms and what times, that's not something that's put together very easily. There's student needs, there's faculty preparation, what is the individual prepared to teach, what rooms are available. That calls for organizational skills. Then there's always human relation skills. Um, how well uh, do, do people deal with others? Are they able to inspire? Are they able to handle complaints? Are they able to exercise discipline? You know, often when suddenly a, a teacher is elevated to an administrative position or a staff member uh, takes on some position, uh, they've had no experience in, say, confronting an employee which may be a problem employee. How do you do that? Uh, how do you change behavior? And if you can't change behavior, how do you uh, document what's happening? Uh, 
personnel issues. There ought to be some knowledge of the education code, uh, that vast body of material that impacts what we do. Um, budget, you know, that's an obvious reality. You have to understand there's finite resources. How are they best used? How can they be used cost effectively? Well, I have only touched on some of the things that are involved, but uh, it, it, it's a tough job. I've, uh, I've often uh, been in the position of looking and trying to determine who would make good leaders and having a hand in appointing them and then encouraging them. Uh, that's one of the key things that's involved in leadership is to build a, a team and encourage the team. And, uh, I remember once uh, a woman who went into uh, administration and uh, after about the first or second month of that, she came in my office and saw them almost tears in her eyes and, and she was recounting to me how she was uh, misunderstood, uh, how that uh, she wasn't exactly prepared for some of the criticism that might come her way. And I smiled and I said, well, um, blank and I won't call her name. Uh, probably there are two things we shouldn't go into if we expect a lot of appreciation. That's parenting and administration. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do get some appreciation. And, and we go into administration because we think we want to be a leader. We, we, we have a vision, and that's one thing that's so necessary for leaders is to be able to point out a direction, a, a way for people to go. Um, I've known some excellent community college leaders. Um, certainly, uh, President Carroll to my right here, uh, she served effectively in three different colleges. She's one of the real veterans uh, of the community college movement. Uh, a recent retiree I think of down at Santa Barbara City College, uh, Peter McDougall, uh, who as a result of his vision there was able to change the face of the campus physically and inspire uh, teachers and inspire new instructional uh, efforts on, on the behalf of that institution. Uh, education, just like anything else, there are great opportunities for leadership, but we're not doing the job in terms of training leaders. The truth is, if we don't train them, we've got to appoint them anyway. Um, I mean, you know, and, and we may make some mistakes. Right now, for instance, in California community colleges, the statistics indicate that the length of tenure for a community college president has gone down to 4.4 years. Uh, back 20 years ago, it was over seven years. In California in 1997, 28% of the college presidents had held their positions for 10 years or more. By 1997, the proportion had fallen to 13%. We hear about community college presidents that maybe last two or three years. I'm not sure all the reasons for that, but I know that part of the problem is that we're not pouring the kind of money and effort into the training of leaders like we should. And so I plant that idea. I'm happy to share with you as we get into the discussion because I'm sure there are questions and comments you'd like to make, and I'll now uh, conclude my remarks uh, with that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We'll now move on to a very distinguished leader in the community colleges who has faced a number of challenges and handled them well, Dr. Constance Carroll. Thank you. You said earlier that leaders always know what to say about themselves, and what I've learned to say about myself is simple. It's not my fault. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> remember that, that that's, that's the key. This, this is, um, uh, as Senator Scott, who is uh, an old friend and uh, probably the best friend to higher education uh, in the California legislature. If uh, every member of the legislature were like Senator Scott, we would have no problems uh, in the state of California. I, I mean that sincerely. Uh, I am uh, a veteran, sounds old, but <laughs> I'm a senior uh, president in uh, the system. 
uh, and have uh, enjoyed and been privileged to have spent uh, 25 years as a community college president. Uh, and uh, in my current assignment at Mesa College, which is a large community college uh, educating uh, 24,000 students, that is going to be my final stop. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity. Uh, along the way, though, I've had uh, two highlights that I'd like uh, to share briefly, One, and they're quite related. One was uh, chairing the uh, uh, WASC Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges following uh, Jack, who was also chair uh, of the commission. Uh, and the other was serving as founding chair of the uh, Community College Leadership Development Initiative, which operates now out of uh, Claremont Graduate University. Uh, and those uh, put leadership uh, both uh, in uh, a very uh, important context for me. Uh, first of all, I learned how turbulent the life of the leader really was in the California community colleges, particularly in the past 10 years. And I also learned how, uh, how th that there was an absolute dearth of opportunities for people to become trained in the art, because I believe it is an art of uh, community college leadership. Uh, across the state, uh, uh, a number of institutions that used to uh, be strong in providing community college leadership opportunities have allowed those programs to dwindle. Um, across the, the WASC region, uh, presidents were lasting uh, one year, two years, as Jack said, and there were reasons for that. And the reasons could be found in the leadership context and showed clearly why there needed to be a study of that leadership context. Uh, we have had the benefit of many other university presidents, and your great president, uh, Don Gerth, uh, in Sacramento has been one of the presidents who's been very, very interested uh, in uh, leadership. Uh, but uh, we are very happy to see this as a topic because it's key. My PhD is, by the way, in the classics, uh, ancient Greek with a specialty in Greek tragedy, and that's exactly why. <laughs> that's why I'm in administration. So. <laughs> First, a, a little bit about the leadership context, and uh, I'm doing this by uh, PowerPoint because this is uh, a new, um, uh, I'm a dinosaur le learning new tricks. Uh, first of all, the community colleges in California aren't really very old uh, when you consider uh, the, national, the, um, uh, the context of higher education. Uh, nationally, community colleges are 101 years old with Joliet uh, as the first. But in California, you can see that the first one was formed in 1910. Today, we have 108 community colleges organized in uh, 72 community college districts. But what is critical, in addition <coughs> to the size of this segment of uh, higher education, uh, is the unprecedented diversity. More than any other segment of higher education, community colleges absolutely mirror the diversity of the state of California. And that uh, provides challenges for us in addition to tremendous uh, opportunities. The California community colleges are also creatures of public policy more than their uh, four-year uh, and uh, graduate and research counterparts are. And I thought I'd walk through some of the policies that have had uh, an impact upon this segment. Uh, in, uh, 19, oh, in 19... Uh, let's see. In 1921, the uh, junior colleges, as they were called then, were officially authorized by the state. In 1960, and I do have a handout with uh, this information, the uh, master plan specified uh, the mission as being transfer, vocational, and general education. By 1987, there was again a reform, and the reform measure uh, gave transfer and vocational technical education as the two primary missions of the community colleges, but in effect 
change the uh, balance of um, weight among the various aspects of the mission with remedial ESL adult education uh, being secondary and uh, an authorized mission community services being third. Now I mentioned this because when I entered what was called the community college movement, the rallying cry of the movement was lifelong education. That has changed radically since I have been uh, president of the community college. Uh, by 1996, a new mission entered uh, with the Legislative Act, uh, Economic Development. And then over the course of the year, of the years, there were legislative mandates uh, provided through categorical funding, matriculation, which has been reduced uh, recently, uh, partnership for excellence, which came in to uh, solve the problems of accountability and funding, which is no longer receiving specialized funding, CalWORKs, which was reduced, uh, child development dis and programs for the disadvantaged and disabled. So I mention that because you can see in a very short period of time in the life of a segment of higher education, there have been some profound and dramatic changes. And that is the context in which the uh, leader of uh, community college needs to operate. Uh, what I have provided next uh, is something from our CCLDI. Thank you. You, you did that exactly as my um, the chair of AV does. Uh, the, we had a design workshop two years ago at CCLDI. It was at uh, Claremont in which uh, people from all segments of higher education participated in a dialogue about community colleges and the leadership traits that would be uh, important for uh, the community college leader. And we identified uh, 12 leadership characteristics that I sh thought I would share with you. Uh, the first are personal uh, qualities. Not everyone is cut out to be a leader, but certainly the, the successful community college leader is someone who understands fully his or her strengths and weaknesses, limits, uh, and uh, abilities. Uh, and we've described that as a, a form of critical self-knowledge. Communication skills and working with individuals and groups. These characteristics are op absolutely necessary because we are also operating in a shared governance uh, uh, environment. The ability to interact, know, work, respect, and nurture people are key elements in the success uh, of uh, a leader, both on the individual level and also in, uh, in groups. The fourth uh, characteristic is cultivating leadership. Oftentimes, uh, leaders think of themselves as hiring institutional leaders, promoting them from within or, or hiring them from without. But very few view it as the leader's responsibility to cultivate leaders. Uh, and that is one of the characteristics uh, of um, uh, the leader in the, in the modern uh, environment, particularly with the vacancies and turnover that we are experiencing. It's estimated now that uh, between now and uh, 2010, there will be a need for almost 800 community college administrative leaders. And the turnover of faculty in the community colleges is projected to be 18,000. And that is, of course, the entry source for department chairs, assistant and associate deans, deans, provosts, vice presidents, and the lot. And those people who are moving into these positions need to be identified uh, and nurtured. Fifth is uh, the institutional culture, understanding it, integrating, and shaping it. Uh, the leader can no longer come into an institution with a preconceived uh, notion of what it should be or a template to oppose, impose upon it. The sixth characteristic is managing, of course, the internal functions of the institution. Uh, we have had a paradigm shift because this used to be, uh, 15 years ago, the primary leadership uh, uh, issue. Uh, 
it was the notion that uh, the community college president should function very much like a, a CEO of a business. All of our nomenclature shifted away from uh, higher education or academic nomenclature into business nomenclature along with accountability. Um, then came Enron, and now we are uh, looking again at, uh, at new terminologies. Seven, uh, planning and organizational development, decision making, uh, all to improve the quality of the institution. Where is that taught? I certainly have never had a class uh, in this particular skill. Eight, institutional leadership, ethics, and ethical analysis. And I mentioned uh, Enron laughingly, but the, the, the business of an ethical environment is a critical one for, for any institution, but particularly the uh, community college. Uh, education, teaching, and learning. The greatest challenge, I think, before uh, most CEOs of community colleges now is the shift from uh, the vi vision of a teaching institution, which is how we've always described ourselves, to the new vision of community colleges as learning institutions. Not just the measurement of skills mastery, but the identification and evidence that learning has actually taken place. Uh, that, ha that has uh, figured prominently in the new standards of accreditation affecting community colleges. Tenth, as I mentioned in, in the chart, is, the, um, is diversity. Community colleges are the most diverse institutions in higher education, and the California community colleges are the most diverse uh, in the nation. The uh, community college leader needs to know how to uh, nurture that, how to make sure that the faculty and staffing and administrators of the college mirror the diversity of the college. These are skills that are important, and even in the post-209 uh, uh, environment are things that must be at the top of the leader's agenda. Eleven is the external environment, educational, political, economic, media, civic. For those of us who work in community colleges, the, the local nature of politics is borne out day in and day out. I had a, a meeting last night uh, with a homeowners group, 300 uh, very angry people because of the uh, enrollment increase at Mesa, which has resulted in massive flooding uh, of uh, the neighborhood by our students' cars. Um, I, I was unfortunately unable to say, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> As I, as I wanted to, but that is a problem that will require tremendous complexity to solve. It requires multi-jurisdictional approach of traffic, of school board, of community college district, uh, neighborhood policy, state law, federal, and the like, in order to work this situation out. These are new terrains and new skills that distinguish uh, the community college administrator uh, or leader. And last, uh, the uh, successful community college leader needs to understand the history and mission of higher education, especially as it affects the community colleges. Uh, the, I, met, I mentioned at the beginning that community colleges used to be described as a movement, and there are many leaders who are trying to return to the notion of a movement, and we are. We are the first exper experiment in egalitarian higher education. Uh, we are now, as uh, Jack mentioned, teaching in the credit uh, side uh, 1,790,000 students, the largest single uh, enrollment in the history of the California community colleges at a time when state policy has not kept pace with the funding that is necessary and at a time when leadership opportunities for leaders um, uh, do not abound. So with the beginnings we've made with the uh, Claremont uh, model, the CCLDI, and with all the other collaborative efforts, we're hoping that there will be many more leadership opportunities uh, for community colleges uh, in the future. Thank you.
Well, I think there's room for one more book. You should do the 12,075th uh, book on leadership. That was a very excellent presentation. Moving to another college president of a college that has reached its uh, highest enrollment in history, uh, Dr. Jolene Kester. Uh, I've been the president of California State University Northridge for two years and four months. I knew I was going to be a president for six months before that, and I want to tell you all that because perhaps given the statistics that our two earlier panelists spoke of, I may not be a president for much longer. <laughs> However, I think that I am on the panel representing still the viewpoint of someone who is relatively new to the role of a president. And the comments that I will make about being a president will perhaps be uh, a little more personal than the previous two panelists as I try to describe for you the, the various intellectual and performance struggles that I have experienced in adapting to this new role. Now, I was very well prepared for being a president, particularly of a California State University campus, because I had worked at Cal State Sacramento for 17 years, the last seven as the chief academic officer. And in doing so, had the privilege of learning about the role of the presidency from someone who is clearly one of the leaders in California in the presidency of a system of higher education, Don Girth. So his style of leadership meant that I was really, I think, as well prepared as I could be without actually being the president. But I also have to say that the old Harry Truman phrase of the buck stops here really is a, um, a non-descriptive way of capturing how different it feels to be the person who is ultimately responsible for the now, at my campus, 32,500 students. I learned that the job is far more complex, has far many more layers to it, is far less predictable, it's far more challenging and exciting as well than I would have predicted. I've not read all 12,074 of the books that our moderator described, but I've read a fair number of them, and there's lots of different ways to slice and dice leadership. I'm going to talk about four specific ways in which I've framed my own approach to leadership, and there's no really write one of these to start with. These are four components and they all affect each other. But nevertheless, for me, they are four ways in which I think about my role as a leader and as a steward of the higher education opportunities for students at my university. And those four elements are first priorities, or you might call it the vision thing, the second is values. The third is tone and symbolism. And the fourth is the stuff of the job. It's the issues that you deal with. And while I'm going to start talking about priorities, you will hear in my conversation about priorities, elements of value and tone and issue, and similarly, when I talk about the other elements. I had heard a lot about the vision thing. I mean, I'm, I don't remember exactly which political campaign it was in. Those of you who are older and who are more attuned to the political realm probably can grab a hold of it. But we've all heard that leaders ha are supposed to have a vision and you're supposed to have priorities. One of the realizations of this leadership opportunity for me with respect to the vision thing and priorities came in understanding that the work of my university is enduring. Presidents and other administrators come and go. Faculty, for the most part, stay. The academic programs stay very similar. And my 
understanding of that was to recognize that that's enduring and that as the leader or the president of the campus, I would be well advised to be selective about those areas and issues that I wish to address during whatever length of time I am privileged to be able to serve in that role. So I began my tenure as president at CSUN identifying four priorities. I will quickly tell you what they are. Improving private fundraising, contributed fund development, strengthening the university's connections internally and with the community, making the campus more user friendly, and improving graduation rates. Now, you can tell immediately that some of those priorities are quite specific and measurable. Others of them are softer and will and have already been transformed into slightly different or slightly more specific goals. But those four priorities guide my time and my energy as well as guide the time and energy of the team of individuals who work with me. We have made ourselves publicly accountable for those priorities. They give us focus, and I can assure you that in any given day, I could spend my time on a whole range of different issues. So those are the four priorities that we are working on, and I believe that they give me a grounding, and it gives those who work with me a real sense of what it is that they too need to focus on. The second element of leadership to me is one's values. Now I came to this understanding as the chief academic officer when one day I realized that I had just made three or four very significant decisions, one walking down the hall as I was going to the bathroom and someone was walking behind me asking about something, another as I walked back into my office and my secretary said, so-and-so just called and wants to know what to do about the following. I then went into a meeting and had a discussion about a very complex problem. There was no way I was ever going to get in the time that I had sufficient information to really make an informed decision about that particular problem. And then I had to walk down the end of the hall again at the end of that meeting and talk to my boss, Don Girth, about another issue. What I learned in reflecting upon that is that in each of those decisions, I ultimately made decisions based on my own values my personal values as well as my values in terms of the role of higher education and the role of university administrators in the life of the institution. So for me, the values that drive what it is I do include fairness and respect for other people, and I hope to model that in my interactions with people, a real joy and celebration of diversity and difference, a real belief that there are different ways to learn, uh, a very, very strong and fundamental belief in access to higher education. I am the daughter of an auto mechanic and a stay-at-home mom, neither of whom had a high school education. So I understand the transformative power of higher education. I also believe in collaboration in doing the work of the university. I may be the president and I am responsible, but I don't always have the right or correct answer. So the leadership of California State University Northridge is a collaborative one. I expect people to disagree with me. I expect to be able to disagree with those that I work with and not have them be um, nervous or upset by the fact that the person who's their boss disagrees with them. Collaboration is a difficult value to create within a group of people, but it's one that I believe firmly in. 
So those are the values I bring to this enterprise. The tone and symbolic aspects of the job are another element of leadership. The leader sets the tone for the way in which leadership is enacted throughout the institution. If there's anything that has surprised me about being a leader, about being a president in the last two and a half years, it is that. Because the tone that I have set is reflected back to me now in the actions of those that work with me, but also those that work in far away places in the, in the university organization. One's tone needs to be consistent. You can't have a public face and a private face. You are the university's president. There really is no private space. So I don't think it's possible to be charming and sweet and loving when I'm out on the campus and then be a shrew with my staff. Somehow there is no blurring uh, or there is no wall separating those two uh, parts of the job. The symbolism of the president's presence is also to me a surprise. It isn't who I am, it is the role that I am serving in that is so important. It is the president appearing at the various campus and community events that says that the university values those activities. One of the difficulties here is that as a president of a public university, there are multiple, multiple constituencies that would like my presence. I have giggled before I became a president and since becoming one at the admonitions in the books on being a university president that tell you to manage your calendar. <laughs> I'm still working on that. Finally, I would say that leadership is as well about the stuff, the decisions, the issues that one has to make. In particular, I think there are some specific issues that those of us in California face. Uh, I think Connie has, has really identified a lot of the key areas, and some of those as well are very specific to California. But in California, we have unique set of expectations with respect to shared governance. I cannot tell you the number of colleagues that I have worked with who have come into this California State University system from other parts of the country and after several months here come to me in the classic stages of culture shock because they are confused and befuddled by expectations around shared governance. I'm not saying that expectations about shared governance in other states are not also equally as bewildering. But I think in California, we have our own particular set of expectations about what shared governance means. And they cause or present to us in leadership roles certain specific challenges. We also right now, I think, have the challenge of enrollment managing what I consider to be a primary value of access with what I consider to be a primary value of quality. In California as well, we have the challenge of an aging faculty that is going to retire at a time when a whole series of other factors, enrollment and budget, complicate our ability to do so. And finally, I think we are presented with the particular challenge of the role of difference in our institutions of higher education. A recent AAUW newsletter with a dialogue between Mary Catherine Bateson and Janetta Cole investigated the issue of difference. And both of these women in this newsletter said that the questions of difference remain central at American colleges and universities. I think for those of us who have the joy and privilege of being at institutions of higher education in California, the challenge of difference is really quite profound. 
My final comment is to say to you that if you've been here for the whole conference, you have heard in several panels reference to needing courageous leaders. And most of the comments that I, I have heard suggest that there is a dearth of courageous leaders in higher education. From my perspective, anyone who assumes leadership among the faculty in the governance of an institution, as department chairs, deans, other administrative positions, and also those of us who serve as presidents are in fact acting out of courage. I think because we believe in the role of higher education. So for me, leadership is tone, symbolism, values, priorities, and dealing directly with the special and unique issues that you face as a leader. Judging from the body language and the head shaking in the audience, I sense that your personal relationship of leadership values resonated uh, <laughs> widely here. I appreciate that. Our, our next panelist who will be speaking is uh, a colleague of mine. I head up the California Post-Secondary Education Commission, which is a planning and coordinating agency here in California. And Bill Proctor is the head of Florida's planning and policy agent. Bill, agency. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll come at this uh, a little bit differently, uh, and I'll revert to when I worked at a community college. And I'll revert, thank you, I'll revert to when I worked at a community college uh, in Florida. We had this thing called a water management district, and it was hidden up in the little town where I live called Brooksville, which none of you have ever heard of. But it's north of Tampa and St. Petersburg, which are on the West Coast, which have a significant problem called water. Uh, I'm sure you never have water wars here in California. We do in Florida. And they called me one day and said, we need some help in some management and supervision courses. And to make a very long story short, I don't think education is much different than other organizations. We have people, we have openings, and we try to move people into those openings, and we find out if they don't get the proper training to be managers and leaders, it creates disasters for them. Uh, so I went out there and actually, because I have a, an undergraduate degree and some graduate training in business, taught some management supervision classes to hydrogeologists and aquatic weed specialists and what have you. They had a lot of, that's where I got most of my part-time instructors at the community college. They had great academic backgrounds, but no management training. So, you know, that's an example of, you know, we're not alone, you know. We are like other organizations. And I guess what I'd like to say about structure in higher education, and, and Robert mentioned it, and we always bandy this around, you know, if we fix our structure, we'll fix everything. Um, and what I usually tell uh, House or Senate committees or anyone who'll ask, the structure doesn't matter. Look around the country at where the great universities, where the good community college systems are. They all have different structures whether it's California, whether it's Wisconsin, whether it's Texas, whether it's North Carolina. Structure is not the issue. The leadership in those states is the issue. And when I talk about leadership, I mean leadership both from the education community and from the government community, the legislature and the governor's office. Um, and we often hear, you know, run education like a business. And I agree with you, I would not want to run education like Enron or Eastern Airlines or American Motors or any of those. But I think we ought to run education like an effective organization. And there's nothing wrong uh, with that. As far as leadership goes, um, you can create opportunities for effective leaders. But I think there are times when 
it doesn't matter. A leader may not be effective. There might be things that mitigate against them, whether it's the political climate, the economic climate, uh, you name it. So it may not be an indictment of that particular person. It may be the environment. Sometimes you're at the, the, the right place, but it is the wrong time and things just don't work. Uh, some things that, that I, uh, I would submit to you are extremely helpful. Uh, build a competent and effective staff. That's the easiest thing to be a good leader. In fact, I just hired uh, a person who worked on the House Appropriations staff. And he came to the realization, he told me, he came into my office, he's worked for me for about three months, and he said, gee, when you made presentations, we always thought you knew everything about everything. And I said, shh, now you know the rest of the people that work around here. And that's why the appearance is that um, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Create a very positive work environment. I think that's important. If you build loyalty in a positive work environment, your people can make you look extremely good. And, you know, that goes from your administrative assistants, support staff, you name it. Um, I think my staff, I would put, and we're in research and policy, I would put them up against anybody's staff in the country, whether it's Pat Callum's staff or you name it. I have a good, uh, diverse group of backgrounds and all of that, and um, they have a lot of, a lot of expertise. And, and you need to communicate with people. Uh, when I worked at a college campus, uh, I called